good afternoon and welcome to History in the Making. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under their Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage. This is the first session of our events themed as Finding Time. We all know that it's important to prioritise, but it can be difficult when we're under pressure to get the balance right between the things that we need to keep our organisations going and the things that we need to keep ourselves going. In Finding Time, we're looking at well-being, motivation and inclusivity. We want to make sure that we recognise these not just as nice to have, but as necessary to have and to support the heritage sector to implement good working practices in these areas. Running from now until March, we have sessions on well-being and accessibility specifically related to staff and volunteers. Bookings are open. Please visit our website or sign up to our mailing list to get the full details and stay up to date with the programme. Little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. Today's session is an in-conversation style event, so we'll be starting off with our speakers and then there will be an opportunity in the second half for questions from the audience. So if you do have any questions, can you pop them into the Q&A box for us? The chat is switched on, so please say hello to your fellow attendees and let us know if you have any tech issues. We've got live captioning switched on today, so if you look at your Zoom menu, you'll be able to find that and switch that on if you want it or need it. And we will be recording today's session and making it available through our website afterwards. Just a little bit for you about the Rebuilding Heritage Programme before we begin. <clears throat> Our programme provides training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources such as today's session, which will be openly available online, as well as one-to-one -one group support, which you can access by application. Applications for round three open on Thursday, the 14th of January, that's this Thursday, and will close at 11 p.m. on Tuesday, the 2nd of February that will be for support that will be running in March and April of this year and full details are available on our website which is rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The application is quite short, we estimate it takes about 25 to 30 minutes to complete and you can express an interest in just one, some or all types of support that are available. For full details and how to apply please do visit our website and you can also follow us on Twitter which is at heritage underscore RH and using the hashtag, hashtag Rebuilding Heritage. Now, onto the session itself. I'm delighted to introduce you to Elaine Human Gurian and Lizzie Glitherow West. Elaine is a senior consultant, advisor, teacher, and writer working across the heritage sector. Elaine has worked in the UK for the Sainsbury Trust and Claw Leadership across a range and across a range of academic institutions. Her new book, Centering the Museum, Writings for a Post-COVID Time, is due to be published later this year. Lizzie is the CEO of the Heritage Alliance, where she identifies overarching messages from Alliance members and amplifies them to opinion formers and decision makers. Lizzie has spent a, the majority of her career in the UK civil service, um, and in her spare time, she writes about the reception of ancient Egypt in the modern day. So over to Elaine to start us off. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from a different place, a different time. Um, I'm in the Caribbean of the United States. Um, as I start, let me, because I know as an American, you'd like to know what I think of all of this stuff. Let me tell you, I can't figure it out quite yet. And that the talk that I'm going to give for the next, I don't know, three minutes or so um, is going to be full of contradictions because, in fact, I think we can't tell how dire the world is and we can't rationalize yet the good things that we're learning and the terrible things that we're losing at the same time. I think this is a time of deep uncertainty. And in that uncertainty, we all have to find our place and deal with our guilt. So lean back and take a deep breath. You've chosen to come here. And what I hope for you is that among the many options and many different ideas that we lay out before you, you will find something that is particularly useful, particularly pertinent to you, and that the rest of it 
goes by in a pleasant way. Um, I can't possibly know what's actually going on for you. And one of the dirty secrets of COVID for me is that I've had a very good time. And that's because I have enough time and enough money. And that's the reality for me. And I've had to make uh, sure that I understood from whence I started and a deep understanding that the world has not fared as well as I have. And that many, many people have fared extraordinarily terribly and have lost members that they love dearly and have lost jobs and have lost economic stability. And so rationalizing, the first step I, I would tell you is the rationalizing between the reality for you and the reality as you read it and to try and figure out where you stand and how you can make where you stand useful to others. Um, the central idea for me and the central takeaway of this COVID pandemic and this terrible political situation where we have looked at how close, how fragile democracy is and how close we are to fascism has been that class disproportionately causes havoc. The poor are the frontline workers. Uh, I heard Chuck Schumer say yesterday, 40% of the deaths in America have been in the Latino community of the United States in the lowest wage jobs. So as we look at inclusion, which we've talked about, and we've talked about inclusion in mostly racial, cultural, and religious terms, I would like to suggest that we look at class and economic disparity. And that we look at it in the most subtle and most diverse and most complex ways we can. That what is missing for people who have not enough time and not enough money is a whole range of things that we in the museum sector can do something about. And they include experiences, taking a chance, redoing the way we write job descriptions and HR, changing the way we expect work to be done so it accommodates family, uh, dealing with the way we assume that there are references and trying to figure out really whether the academics that we think are essential are really essential. The island I live in has saves itself. It saves itself because it allowed people to begin to assert what they knew how to do in a, in a landscape that did not accept that um, the hierarchy in world of work was the hierarchy. Um, I start almost every talk I give to say all things are philosophy. Then I say everything is philosophy. Every single decision you make is philosophical. And to think that there's a separation in the way in which you work between what you firmly believe, that is what your moral character is, what you find essential, how you treat your family, does not show up in your work and that there's a separation is not true. Um, I also have learned over the years to believe in unfinished, unresolved, nuance, complexity, and doing small things that add up. And therefore, because all things are philosophy, I believe in small things that you can do within the realm of your own orb. I believe that you are powerful and that within your job description, within your field, within, your, within everything that your landscape is, you are an effective person if you do not prioritize the impossibly high or the impossibly idealistic. Um, one of the things that I've discovered, and I spend a lot, a lot of time on on uh, Google, finding out that almost uh, there's almost an uh, an experiment 
being done by the museum sector everywhere. Every single experiment that you're thinking about, it, someone is doing. The sector is not doing it, but some small institution is doing it. And that one of the things that's important to me is one doesn't really want to be innovative, even though we talk about it. One really wants company and you can really have company by exploring things that interest you and then talking directly to the people. In that regard, you can write to me. My email is available and my website has all my writings for free. I would expect that you want to push against the limits of mission as the limiting factor. I have forever heard, but we don't do this in museums or we don't do this in the heritage sector. Well, we do. Somebody does. Every single thing that has social relevance in your neighborhood is being done by somebody. Yesterday, I learned the Baltimore Museum of Art um, in my country is closed. They just gave their parking away for full-time COVID testing. Everyone is pushing against their mission and their most direct obligation to look at the needs completely surrounding their particular site and then seeing if they have the assets to do that. By assets, I mean you have physical space, you have heat, you have light, you have electricity, you have running water, you have toilets. Those are real assets. And you have human assets. You have people who know how to knit and how to walk dogs. You know how to pe people who know how to take care of children. These are real assets. And I do something called asset mapping. What do we have? How can we barter it? Who needs what? If you're not too fussed by what assets we have and how we can use it rather than what the sector is supposed to be doing, you will find you will become incredibly relevant. One of the things I know is going on for you is that you have an economic downturn, all of us do. There's something going on called green shoots. That is people are pivoting and figuring out businesses. Uh, if you go on the web and you ask uh, what businesses are growing during COVID, you will discover many. Um, some of them are conspicuous about their middle class um, ability to pay for, but some of them aren't. Um, and my belief about the museum sector is we have a public obligation. A charity is not a business, but can earn money. So the decision about when you earn money and when you don't is a decision, a deeply moral decision about your institution. And let me give you an example. One of the ways in which education is being done in my country and in your country is called pod learning. That is, we hire a babysitter who is an out of college, non-job person to give some, to take care of our children and to teach them. That may turn out to be the very best way to teach people. Museums in my country are asking for money to do that. And museums in your country are doing it for free called my primary school is in the museum. That what you do as a pivot for money and what you do as a pivot in which a third party can pay for you is one of the ways in which you can begin to think about what you're gonna be doing. Um, I'm very interested in non-hierarchical work. It's called network theory. It is the way in which work is being done in disaster. And I live on the island where the hurricane destroyed the island and where we in fact have grown to understand how to rebuild it. Um, I would say to you, research everything, see who's doing what, call them up try it out. COVID is an undercover time where experimentation is not going to have the same eyes on you that other times do. And therefore, very small, very useful things can happen. Make friends and see if you can build new networks.
I'm done. It's your turn. Thank you, Elaine. Um, as a perfect kind of starter, really, and I'm sure it's uh, raising a lot of questions in, in many of our minds. And I think as we as we go along, we're going to move into a period of conversation between uh, between me and Elaine. And I have a number of questions already that I'm going to pose to her um, and also to discuss between ourselves. But be, do drop in to the Q&A um, any any kind of further questions for us to pick up later and any reflections really on um, what you're gaining from this, anything that's surprising you, things that, that others might might like to um, to see as well. Uh, so this is very much an opportunity for a bit of time to really think as well. So perf I think a perfect kind of segue from uh, from what you've just said, Elaine, into a kind of key first question really is uh, we're in another lockdown in the UK um, and this is hitting people really differently. Uh, I think there'll be some of us on, on this call who are alone and uh, kind of working alone and have been for a while. There are others on the call who are juggling homeschooling. Uh, there'll be those who are trying to get out to site, those who are continuing to try and work in a digital manner. Um, and for everyone, however, this, this has felt like a lot. And I think coming back into this, it, it feels like a lot. Um, and it is good to have a chance for us to reflect and just take a moment for ourselves to think kind of constructively and positively as um, about our sector and to have a program as Sarah's already set out around well-being and and this is a, a need that's emerged over the course of the program actually it wasn't something that was necessarily planned in right from the outset but it's something that we're really hearing from the sector that as we move kind of into a new phase and we move into a kind of hybridity of working that that might be really needed uh, as part of that conversation. So my, my question to Elaine, I think you've already touched on it briefly, uh, but what, what with all of that in mind, have we learned from this period of isolation, different though it may be for different people, and the challenges of different ways of working? What are your reflections on what we can really take from this? Well, I have a couple. One is, the pressures of children and animals in your Zoom meeting, I find an enormous positive. And it's a positive for the children as well. Our children have learned what work is. Our children have understood that they are part of the system. They have to be quiet, they have to help, they have to do things that, that has an economic benefit. The kind of privileged child outside the system with parents mysteriously disappearing is gone. And I think that's enormously good for the children and for us. Uh, the notion that for, um, I have seven grandchildren, two of them are very proud to be introverts. They want to tell you that the Zoom has been an enormous benefit for them and that they, they all, all my grandchildren are grown-ups and they have jobs and they are thriving. So one of the things we need to be looking at is even though we've always talked about Gardner's multiple intelligences, this COVID period has worked well for people for whom our usual society has worked badly for. Um, too much pressure, too much input, too much demand for them to be sociable. So. It is an uneven landscape. One of the things we have discovered is people have learned things, done things outside of their um, class, if you will. So uh, a mother here in, on my island has taught art history to her children because Pinterest is free and pictures are available. So things have happened in this time and we need to look at who has learned what and see if we can make use of it. I think there are things that will never go back. Uh, we, there is no old normal that's going to reappear. One of the things we've learned is the preciousness of outside activity and how people use outside. I think museums have thought of the confines of their building too much and turning to the outside is something that they should be paying real attention to. What do you feel like, Elaine, that we've, we've lost in this period? And what, what are your kind of reflections from the working world that we should, that we've gained and we should 
hold on to? Well, the, the big loss, which we need to really pay attention to is these deaths in my country now, uh, uh, 400,000 humans, these deaths have hit our society in incredibly unfair and disproportionate ways. There are enormous deaths in uh, our society that have opened up the disproportionate healthcare section, the disproportionate access to food insecurity, the disproportionate access to school alternatives. Uh, I mean, the deep division in our country is now amplified by how many people they have lost of their own world. Um, so that part is just front and center and global and gigantic. The world of work has um, opened up as well. We've uh, figured out that you do not have to be there all the time. And people whose children did not go to school and who had time and money have relocated themselves. So the hollowing out of cities to uh, rural parts of my country or to really rural, I mean, to live on a tiny island is possible because um, the internet allows that. And so we're seeing relocation for the rich and we need to look at what relocation for the poor would look like. And then what ways do we have to help them? That's, that's fascinating, kind of the, the sort of the bigger perspective on this stuff, isn't it? I suppose when I'm you know, speaking to Alliance members and you know, thinking about what this means directly for us and our world of work and just kind of pondering what, what we've gained and what we've lost. And I think um, even amongst Alliance membership, there's a real range. There's those who are, those who've been on furlough, those who have been still there in organizations where others have been on furlough um there's been those who are keeping organizations running um with the challenge of with funding challenges with changes to events and things i think kind of reflecting what i've really missed over this time um i miss the kind of being around colleagues the buzz the hive mind the, the conversations that happen in the margins uh, the you know the relationship stuff that happens over the the fun event which is actually crucial it's not peripheral the you know the opportunities to actually go and kind of invest yourself and be in a heritage site and kind of soak in why this stuff matters you know there's been a lot of the a lot of the slog and a lot less less of the fun and i think um kind of holding on to some of that the kind of relational stuff and the what happens when you're actually in a room with people as opposed to having to kind of sit there and schedule a, another conversation about another thing that can only be between those you invite on that call I know has been really missed by those who might work on a completely different thing to another person within my office but they will they'll, you kind of absorb it don't you when you're you're hearing those conversations and I think we'll have to really think about that and the, I suppose the flip side of that is and really obvious in this program and in our heritage digital program that we're all learning new skills we're definitely the alliance as we're going we're kind of learning new digital skills and implementing them immediately you know we're seeing that we're we're as organizations capable of of doing things and, and also implementing things we hadn't necessarily thought of doing before which will be great bring great inclusivity, I think, into the future. You know, it kind of removes some of the regional challenges of people getting to things if you're able to focus on um, different means of providing what you need. And I think a real opportunity for us, but something we ought to really proactively think about into the future as a sector is that, that hybridity. Because at the moment, we're either, you're either on site or you're working digitally. We don't have that many organizations that are doing a huge mixture right now. Um, I think a, an interesting challenge into the future will be when an organization, say a support organization like ours, has some people working from a particular location, others in the office, how, how do we harness the best of what was there before, the best of this period, and kind of move through, I think, into a, a period that kind of works for that, that full range of both operations and individuals within our organizations. And that's definitely something that 
I'm, I'm having conversations at the moment and really pondering. And I think it's going to be an opportunity, but also a challenge for, for those leading in the heritage sector into the I'd future. Like to, I'd like to say two things in, in response to what you said. First, people are experimenting with this digital technology so that serendipitous meetings can take place. Zoom planned meetings is not the only way to use this. Um, I have a grandchild who is in the gaming world. The gaming world gets up in the morning, turns on Zoom, and it's on all day. They have no meetings. They're doing their work, but they can talk to everyone as if they're in an open plan organization. So there are many different ways to use Zoom, but the biggest thing I'd like to impose is that people who have to get up and leave their home to do their work are now called essential workers. That's the first time in my country that we've understood the cashier is an essential worker, the postman is an essential worker. In your museum, not on this line, are such workers, the, the person who is cleaning it, your security agent, your lockdown, your gardener, people who have to get up and cannot do what you're doing represents a huge part of our working sector. And it's on, if we're talking, that's why I'm interested in income inequality and in class. If we're talking about the world of work, I want to know what we're paying them. I want to know what their benefits are, but I also want to know what we're training them and what their opportunities are so they can, if they wish, leave that world of essential work. In my country, they're in the world of essential work because their opportunities were lessened by their own heritage, by their own circumstance. That's a big piece of our own inclusion work that we need to be doing. And that leads on to a, a second related question, Elaine, and be interested to hear your, your perspectives on this. It's definitely something that, that's been in discussion on our side, which is we've, we've kind of really seen into each other's lives and been more human to each other over this period. And I think the way that you're talking about this stuff is very much about the humans behind the workplace. Um, and I suppose on, on one side, that could be quite invasive and it can be quite exposing. On another side, I suppose it it shows the reality of pressures and, and, and people's kind of lives. We're literally seeing into each other's living rooms. What do you think this, this element of the lockdown period might mean for the world of work and, and what, what positives might we take from it? I, I think it's essential. I, I believe that the HR department is the central location for inclusion work. And that is that the world of work has made an assumption about what work is that's based on a, a hierarchical position, mostly men-based, uh, mostly power-based, where we allow how much information and we set out supervision for others. This world of network theory is a, is a world of entrepreneurs. That is, we set out ways to work with each other, but we understand the individuality. But if you wanna look at the world of work and cultural inclusion, for example, one of the biggest things I've learned on this island is that parents who are home with their children cannot use your hours. They have to pick up their kids. They have to deliver their kids. They have to. So the definition of family and the world of work are antithetical unless we decide to do something other. The deepest interrogation of what we've assumed is the world of work is the place where I think um, inclusion is truly going to happen. What is the gender roles? What are the difficulties for single parents? What are children learning? After all, the world of work, when children were part of the workforce, when the family unit was the economic unit, was entirely different. And that is true for rural kids and farm kids who have chores which are not made up. They're not take out the garbage. They are part of the economic system. And I think 
if we're going to do serious work, we're going to look at philosophies of work post COVID and philosophies of work that allow for inclusion in a different way. So just building on that, Elaine, I think it's a really interesting area. It's an area that the Alliance is, is thinking about as sort of our, our next project uh, after our wellbeing uh, report last year. That do you, I, I think you've obviously said that you already think that our pondering and our thinking on equality and inclusion has, has changed over the last year in, in relation to these circumstances. In which specific ways do you think um, we need to be really worried about we need to be alert to which which areas have some of those kind of inclusion areas um exacerbated problems that may have already been there what are the some of the new ones from from your perspective that that may be arising that that we ought to be alert to well uh, in this case i have to talk about the united states but i understand in your brexit world it's not so dissimilar um, the United States is polarized to the extent that we don't even share facts, truth, norms, um, ways of believing each other. We don't have any of the systems of talking to each other in place. If America is not to tear itself apart, then the inclusion is going to have to be what does healing look like with people we hate, not with people whose skin we admire and whose culture we admire. And I think we are totally unprepared for trying to figure out with what the healing looks like. Uh, Joe Biden is an authentically nice guy with an authentic moral center. He's not the world's smartest. He's not the world's best president. He is a decent human, and in that decency may turn out to be the, the modular way that we look at what we need to do next. What is truth? What is kindness? What is lowering the, the tone? What are small things? What are uh, things that are good for our kids? What is food and breaking bread together? What is um, helping your neighbor look like is going to turn out to be the only route, I think, to begin to heal the country. Because if you start at the dialogue level, we don't even have a, pl I mean, I have a, a cousin who voted for Trump. He is precluded from talking to me because we cannot get through a sentence. So we only show pictures of our mothers or our grandparents because we have so few places which is allowable for conversation. I don't think, I think that's the pro and anti-Brexit people come from that dialogue as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and part of this is about experience. I mean, if you look at the travel sector, the travel sector was based on time and money. But if you look at most of the work that we do in the museums, we believe that there is some commonality of experience of shared reading, of shared television watching, of jokes. Of, and that turns out not to be true. And the rhetorics that we have and the jokes we have and the uh, small gestures we have are in fact themselves excluding or not. Um, I like to say I've trained my children to be able to walk into five-star hotels to use the toilet in foreign cities by looking like they have rented a place there. We can get away with that, even though I'm a Jew, because we have enough manners and our clothes will pass scrutiny. So there is an enormous amount of signaling going on that the museum sector hasn't dealt with that they need to go way back to bedrock. What does welcome look like? What does signaling look like? Who is sitting at the front desk? Where have you placed your furniture? And do you have free Wi-Fi? Um, this is small stuff that is really crucial. And that obviously in the short term, and you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the American, we, we kind of look across to what's going on in America and you know, we have a slightly different situation, but there are many parallels. So it's really interesting that kind of, as you said, the Brexit debate 
has really divided families, it's divided friends, it's, it's, it's been really challenging, I think. And, and further to that, the, the COVID situation has, I've seen, has really created an, a north-south divide over the way that things were handled. Um, and, you know, even in jokes, but jokes are indicative of something bigger, aren't they? That um, that, that kind of division in how, how areas perceive themselves to have been seen. Um, there's, there's also, I think, that there's, there's a real ticking time bomb um, around between the kind of lib some liberal or considered to be liberal agendas and some of the kind of more traditionalist agendas. And I think we, we have a real challenge here as well. And I think this government is really live to that, that kind of ticking, ticking time bomb as well in political terms as well. I mean, we've never seen anything like the last four years in terms of the turbulence of politics. Um, and and what, what, from your perspective, do you think are some of the longer term implications of the pandemic for, for sort of demographics and audience engagement. You've touched on some of these already, but I, I suppose from my, my perspective a little bit and from the Alliance and advocacy, that I do feel like if, if heritage is gonna get traction for, in its own terms, it has to be part of solving other societal problems, other public policy problems. And we want to be doing that anyway, um, but I think making that case and showing how Im important we are to either well-being or that we are, we're live to these and, and we are solving some of these inclusion issues for society will be you know, part of our future. Interested to see your perspective on, on those longer term implications as well. Well, the culture sector has split the larger culture sector has for a very long time been about the transfer of information, often the transfer of information based on things. Um, but there's been a stream of the culture sector that I have belonged to my entire work life, which is in the social service world. That's community museums and, um, and you have had in your country, a a whole world of that culture sector that has worked on the well-being of the neighborhood, if you will. That's where Echo Museums come from. That's where the shutdown industrial sites come from, things like that. My instinct is that you want to go out and talk to your immediate neighbors and ask them what they want um, rather than what you have on offer, what they want, what do they want to have access to your space and have picnics? I, I worked for two years in a place where the picnic table was the most contested because, oh my God, they would bring food, not ours. Yes, indeed, the picnic. So what do they need? What do they want? What do their children want? Can we supply stuff? I worked in Ecuador where, um, where people said neighbor was the highest category of membership. And what they wanted was access to using the classrooms at nice night for further education. Um, so I want you to look at what, the, what does your immediate neighbor need, want, and in what way can you use your assets to be incredibly useful for them? because you have assets of delight and assets of curiosity and assets of memory and assets. And all of that can happen if you're willing to deal with what's the language of welcome and what's the language of explanation. Remaining within our frame of how we do things and how we deliver information and what we think of you we think of you as learners, not as smart as us, uh, needs to end. That, that's for us to be really useful is to, be, is to make ourselves think how to be really useful. What do people want and need? And a final one in this section, Elaine, I can see uh, some comments kind of coming in down the side now. Um, Louise saying the asset mapping approach is really, really interesting. And um, Lucy as well talking about um, how we have to make heritage relevant to other people's lives. Chris talking about the kind of green recovery element there. Um, as, a, as a kind of final question, I suppose, in, in this section, how 
do you think one organisation can go about thinking about being part of positive change and changing the sector? I, I always think that you want to be small and under the radar. You don't want anybody of power to get upset. You want it to be as cute and as innocuous as possible. You want it to be for children and families. What could be wrong about teddy bears picnic or a, that kind of thinking about not big splash, not big anything. Who needs what cultural help do people need? Where have they come from and in what way can they inform you? In what way can we share across the backyard fence? Do they know, have they brought skills that they could give you? Do we have to have high-end restaurants as our only restaurants? Do we have to have high-end shops as our only shops? Do we have to have help made stuff as our only made stuff? The, the way in which we begin should not upset our board of directors or our local authority or anybody. And I'll tell you another secret that I've learned. If you can sustain anything small for a year, it's tradition. We always did it that way. People have incredibly short memories. So having, now the teddy bears picnic is a event in a botanical garden in Wellington, New Zealand, where everybody brings their teddy bear and they talk about their children, talk about their teddy bears to each other. It's a one summer day experience in a botanic garden. Everybody in Wellington, of course, goes to the teddy bears picnic. These, I think you need to also externalize all this navel gazing, you're racist, no, you're racist, no, you're racist, doesn't help. Uh, we all have kids, we all have grandparents, we all have ideas, we all have memories. Can we externalize it and do that work? Because the secondary gain of seeing strangers is that they discover they're quite like you. They take good care of their kids, they tell funny stories, they're friendly. And that's the outcome you want. So not big, not splashy, not gigantic, not in your face, not um, pejorative. How can we come together? How can nobody notice until a year later when we tell our, our board chair because we become so famous that we had the teddy bears picnic that it's all over the newspaper? That's my advice. Like it cha changed by stealth. Um, That's right. And, um, I mean, I obviously also you've you've talked about the kind of the networked element to this. And I mean, what what are your kind of final reflections um, on because that might be an individual organization might come up with these ideas. But you're talking also about kind of finding those points of commonality, kind of working with others. I mean, what are your reflections, I suppose, on because one thing that I would say that has been truly wonderful over this period um, is just the kind of the generosity of organizations in making their assets available, the kind of the real collaborative mindset that many of my colleagues around the sector have, have had. I mean, they've kept me sane. Um, you know, there's been a lot of kind of really goodwill in wanting to work together over this period, even through, through a a period of incredible challenge. What would you say are the kind of the networking elements of this? Where are the opportunities and things that we might build on from those reflections about change by stealth, I suppose? Well, uh, you know, the Nina Simon story, the Museum Association in your country story is all there for you to do this. We all have email, we all have, uh, possibility of blogs. We all have ways to network. We all need to not be afraid of doing it. Um, I sent Sarah a link that is yours. It's Museum Now or something. Um, it's all the people, big and small museum sector who are working doing, doing community-based social heritage. So it includes Wales, but it includes the Hackney Museum. Um, you, you in your country have this long tradition. I owned a home in Walthamstow. I had a library card in Walthamstow long before Walthamstow was trendy. 
um, your country working class people use the library, your country working class people used to use the museums when they were free, but they used them for different purposes. Let's find out those purposes and reinstate them. Everybody can network, everybody can post their ideas, everybody can write to friends, everybody can have company. You should, one of the things you should do is send out uh, everybody's email address who's been on this meeting so they can talk to each other instead of just to us. Thank you, Elaine. That's a perfect point for us to kind of move across into our final section with our questions. Now, before I hand over to Sarah, I'm just going to pick up one question that has kind of popped up down the side. Um, Amy, thank you. You're saying you're interested in hearing more about how the heritage and cultural sector can work with other sectors to share knowledge and resource. I mean, the first thing I would say, I'm biased here, of course, but uh, join the Alliance if you're not a member of the Alliance. You know, we exist to bring together uh, the kind of many, many parts of our sector to, to in essence, make them more than the, the sum of our parts. And, um, you know, it might be that there's things that we are doing that, um, that can save you time. It may be that it gives you a voice in forums that you may not be in. You know, we do work closely with our sister bodies and other organizations um, as well. And, and there's a lot of kind of thought work going on. And actually some of it's just bringing people together to just talk about what's going on for them as well. Uh, we have a CEOs group, uh, just to talk about challenges and opportunities and some of the things that I was mentioning earlier about hybridity of working and kind of change and pace of change and, and how, how people feel. So I think do do join the Alliance and do join us um, because I think that the, the breadth, um, the, the broader we are, the, the more powerful a voice we are to, to kind of speak on heritage and to provide those networks and opportunities for gathering some of this good practice, which is what we've been trying to do with our reports in the last couple of years. Uh, so details will follow on that for anyone who isn't already a member. And those of you who are, who may not be on some of our groups, um, it may be that your organisation is a member, but you're not plugged into some of these conversations. Do get in touch. We'd love to involve you um, if you're on this call and, and not on some of our advocacy groups, for instance. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah, um, who I think has got some questions. You've been collating them. They've been coming Absolutely. in. Yeah, some really interesting and very thought provoking questions coming in. Um, and I, I'm, the first one I'm going to take is relating to trauma, because I feel that that's it's it's very pertinent at the moment when we're talking about COVID. And Elaine, I think you were absolutely right to stop and take a moment to acknowledge the, the kind of the huge loss um, of life in COVID, because as the as the crisis extends, I think it's it, it's terrifyingly easy to lose sight of that. So thinking about trauma, what can we in the heritage sector do to help people to understand, face and move beyond trauma and the division it leads to as well? So about 10 years ago, I edited a book called Institutional Trauma, which mm. I wrote in Great Britain when I lived there. Um, and uh, there's a chapter that will come up in my new book, which is a reprise of this. One of the things that we in work need to pay attention to, and let me go back to things Lizzie said, we need to look at everything outside our sector and in the mental health sector, Trauma has all kinds of support systems. This has been an enormous trauma for some people. Work at uh, an unfair place um, causes staff trauma as an institutional issue. And our leadership role is to pay attention and to mitigate it people who are really suffering in our workplace are our family. So there are lots of um, mental health support systems you can bring into your place. It is part of your work. As soon as you make the mental switch that staff having trauma is part of your work, you start to look at all the systems available to you and there are many. Um, so it's a really important question and it's worth talking about and looking at. Coping mechanisms for staff is uh, a real issue, but I, I make the distinction between coping mechanisms for us as individuals and looking, institutional trauma is the assumption that the whole institution is itself an organism and needs to be looked at. 
That's a brilliant way of looking at it, Elaine. I was going to suggest, sorry, Sarah, you were going to come in. Now's probably a good time to to mention the the couple of things that we've got coming up in this space because we felt like people have really needed this and you've shaped the programme around it. No, absolutely. Lizzie mentioned about the wellbeing work that we're going to be doing on the Rebuilding Heritage programme, um, which wasn't... Um, it wasn't originally in the plan because it's a business support program and the reason we folded it into the program is because um, we can't we can't take care of our organizations if we're not taking care of our own people and we can't take care of the heritage sector if the organizations aren't well so we've got coming up well-being at um, well-being at work which is next Thursday and then the following Thursday we've got a well-being gym which is quite a practical session um, with kind of activities and um, uh, resources to help people to think about their own personal well-being but they're also resources that people can incorporate into how they're supporting their staff I'm going to drop the, in, the, the general booking link that'll take you to both of those um, both of those events um, and all of the stuff that you can you can find out about that upcoming well-being training and support and if you apply to the program and the applications open on Thursday you can also apply for a managing well-being training course we've got places available on that so that you can actually find out from our trainer kind of ways to implement this for your staff and volunteers. So while we're on the well-being topic I might drag uh, one kind of observation from from the comments uh, Amanda's Please comment um, it said you're really interested in Elaine's observation about how Covid has had the benefits of the introverts amongst us. Um, I, I'm definitely an extrovert, although I've found the introvert in myself since I've had children, I think, as well. Um, but the but absolutely the you know that's a particular um, is a particular category of our of our workforce, isn't it? That that kind of have in, introverted tendencies, need time to recharge. Um, Elaine, is there any work out there any research work that you're aware of in answer to Amanda's question um, on on this it doesn't have to be sector specific it doesn't have to be kind of culture specific I I don't know the work but I would point to you that Mark O'Neill of your of the UK did oh, excellent service on, did uh, work on health and longevity on a very big scale and I would go to him. He's also a famous introvert. Um, so um, I don't know the work going on, but I would also say that for the extroverts among us, we have learned more internal resources than we ever had before. We've learned more ways to deal with our fidgeting by reading more stuff or dancing or singing um, in our privacy of our spaces. Um, so I think there's been skill building for all the different sectors. Um, the introverts of my grandchildren want to tell me that they're just calmer and happier because the world around them is not expecting them to behave in ways that are take a deep toll on them. I don't know the research, but I suspect there is. But for the introverts, that would be a good moment to get yourself allied with a whole different sector. Who are the introverts and what are they doing and what help can they give each other? I'm just gonna take us onto a slightly different topic now um, because we, one of the questions that came, came through, which I think is very interesting, is about how we're, we're seeing the importance of nature and access to green space is going to be central to um, recovery and also, and wellbeing. Um, but how can we ensure the value of cultural heritage and heritage, sites and venues that don't have outdoor space is recognized as central to our recovery. So um, Jane Jacobs wrote about um, one of the foundational books in my life is called The Death and Life of the Great American City. It was written in 1969 and she talks about the anthropology, if you will, of the city street. So the city street is outside. Um, we have green space, I understand. We also have how is the city operating and what are recreational spaces and what are new things that are happening in the urban space to replicate the well being for this. For example, there are um, small parking spaces that have been turned into parks um, or at least sit downs in your street. There are whole streets that have been shut down in, in residential places so children can play. There, so let's not 
get ourselves totally focused on, I have to go to the green space and it's far away and I'm in lockdown, let's do a different assessment. How can you, in my neighborhood, for instance, at the very beginning of COVID, back to teddy bears, uh, my entire neighborhood did uh, teddy bears um, hidden all over the windows of your houses so that children could go on a treasure hunt with a uh, spy glass to see if they could see teddy bears that were lurking in funny places. Are there ways in which we can turn externally? One of the ones I care the most about is the world of reproductions. Reproductions, are, we think because we have the real thing, reproduction is a lesser thing, but reproduction is an access to something outside of a big scale in which people without spending money could have access to. So can we do exhibitions outside? Um, and can they be secure and interesting? There are a lot of people using their fences to turn around and have public interaction and talking to each other. Um, I also agree that there is um, the world of Climate change is essential. We make a less a footprint on the globe by this lockdown. We have been inadvertently better to the planet. Uh, I recommend that you read somebody who is a Brit named Mike Hume, spelled H-U-L-M-E. He's a professor in Cambridge, I believe, and he wrote Why We Don't All Agree About Climate Change. It's about the cultural meaning of climate. He also is a, a big fan of do small things. Climate change is too big. It's too big a construct, makes us feel impervious to be helpful. But in fact, staying home and doing small things matter. So um, there are lots of ways in which outside our front door matters. And where uh, one of the things I write about, about strangers and stranger uh, inclusion is where do we think our private space happens and how much before our front door do we believe is our public responsibility and how much past our front door do we think that's a public asset? Do we give free coffee? Do we have free Wi-Fi? Or can kids come use the toilets? What are our assets? So one of the things I have written about is something called the Open Your Lobby movement. Open Your Lobbies were done by theaters in the United States during the Black Lives Matter demonstrations where they made all their physical assets free to the demonstrators, toilets, electricity, air conditioning, water. Almost no museums helped. Some, but almost no museums because their space is the security parameter of their preciousness. Well, that's baloney. We know how to fix that. So what does inside and outside, what does public and private mean in this situation? And for wellness, we know people getting outside the house, but not congregating is important. And can we aid that? I think that's really interesting. And then on a, I think just on a really, for me, I just want to chip in with a really practical one, which is mm -hmm. that if organisations think of themselves very much as kind of small islands, yes, you might, you might have a physical asset um, and you think of yourself as not having an outdoor space, but if you go beyond, as you were saying, Elaine, it's kind of where do you see the, the, the boundaries of your property? If you start to look at who's in your neighbourhood and who are your kind of potential local partners, then it opens up the opportunity for you to, to have outdoor space by using outdoor space that perhaps belongs to somebody else. <laughs> exactly, right. And this stuff links in so much to the kind of, I suppose the hat I'm wearing, which is the UK policy hat really, which is, you know, how are we playing into the leveling up agendas and um, how are we, um, I think something that's really interesting that's, that's emerging over the COVID period is just the, the real power of the ultra local and what is really around us in the spaces that we're able to inhabit. You know, we, our worlds have kind of gone a bit like this, haven't they? And the, the green space immediately around us and the inequalities of access to green space have been, have been challenging over this period as well. And I think the nature of the high street, you know, we're going to see the high street really changing. It was going to happen anyway um, with, with the kind of uni universal kind 
certainly digitization of shopping and things but i think over this period as well we're going to see that even more so and where we've got cultural assets or we've got heritage assets they they may be more at the heart of where people go or or the high street or what what these kind of communal spaces become into the future i think the well-being thinking about the well-being agenda and our role in that thinking about how uh, some of our assets can give environmental returns over this period uh, thinking about where actually heritage i've we've written about this before is the kind of the the muse and the asset and the backdrop of creativity we our stuff it may not be open to the public often uh, some of it is some of it isn't but our stuff is absolutely the enabler of other sorts of activity like that as well and um, it shouldn't be taken for granted and it often has and i think one of the real benefits over this period i've seen is Definitely the, the well-being um, elements of heritage and particularly the outdoor spaces are, are now being recognised in the, the guidance that's coming out. You know, they're still open for, not for recreation, but for exercise, uh, whereas many other things are closed. Um, and also, I think the sort of... Um, the the thing i think we're seeing what's really lacking i mean it, it's really interesting in education you know, what what are our children missing they're missing site visits they're missing museums and heritage sites and that sort of dynamic element of learning my kids are really really missing it that these things are just so integral and i think i would say that the that the money at the moment that's coming out of government is is not being seen really as a bailout but an investment i think we've got some way to go in that but i think continuing to make that point that this is an investment that this is an investment in public goods is really really fundamental as part of our argument um and as part of the recovery lizzie i would also say that one of the interesting things in america because inside space is so dangerous is that we are of course in the restaurant sector for example inventing outdoor space in winter hmm. so the outdoor space becoming what we thought was only indoor space is the reverse of what indoor space becoming now outdoor space so mm -hmm. my public park sector in uh, a very mixed neighborhood outside of washington has what look like work pods with free wi-fi that are outdoor in public parks so work can be done so kids can do school so they can have access to broadband so the notion about what was appropriate in each sector needs to be rethought and we can yeah. be part of that absolutely it's really interesting sarah do you have another one for us i do indeed so um an interesting question here about how do we shift the dynamic in the heritage sector so that we are thinking about learning from our audiences rather than teaching them um and the heritage in you know in the past has had the um been a bit kind of one way and didactic so how do we how do we shift that balance as a sector it's a force of will it happens person by person it is an individual decision the sector is really a confluence of all of us. It is how we were trained, that we are educational and we know things and we know things about our stuff. And they, whoever they are, know less about our stuff and should be interested if they're not interested. Um, let me say what I hope everybody gets out of this. Every decision is a personal force of will. So if you want to talk to your neighbors, talk to your neighbors. Start with your cleaners. Start with who's coming in late at night and your cashiers and find out what they need and where they live and do you know their names and what their aspirations are. That's, it is the sector, we cannot change the sector except people like Lizzie who are dealing on the policy level. What we can do is Mine is show what can be done. You become incredibly famous if you're an outlier. So I suggest you just do it. You want to talk to the, the neighborhood, go talk to the neighborhood. Um, my favorite story is that um, in one place, they got a gift of many pie tins. They put the pie tins outside the front door with a sign which said apple pie next Tuesday, bring your favorite res recipe. Everybody brought apple pie. They had, there are things, just don't think big, think 
change in my place, change within my scope of work, change because I want to do it, and that's how change happens. I think the the kind of the the you saying the kind of start small the not thinking of these these kind of impossible mammoth tasks. So I'm, I'm I've just put it in the chat, but I'm going to put it to everybody now that if people would like to share with us um, what your what your what surprised you today, what's what actions might you take, and it doesn't have to be something massive. What what little thing might you do, having come along today and listened to Elaine and Lizzie giving um, such thoughtful insights into the sector and um, the kind of world we're in at the moment. And I'm going to put that to Elaine and Lizzie as well so Elaine and Lizzie what are your sort of if, if, if people could walk away from today's session with kind of one takeaway one thing what what is it mentor somebody um, raw talent is all around you help them to figure out how they can learn things I'm about to do on my small island a one-hour workshop on how you run meetings because they want to run meetings in their own sector and the dialectic doesn't, they're not experienced in that. Look at your personal assets, look at the people around you, hand it forward. Uh, I think the thing that, that's been really, I mean, lots, lots of thoughts uh, stimulated by you, Elaine, to be honest, but um, I think the change by stealth element um sorry that was my word but it, it was your kind of small small change do what you can and i think coupled with that really is you know we are a generous sector we're not that precious about you know our idea or his idea or her idea i think there is something about collaboration and sharing and change that if we're finding that there's something that works or we write a policy on something that's good or you know there's a little thing that is making a difference finding ways to be sharing that and being generous with that is something that I'm sort of reflecting on and obviously from the perspective of the alliance you know we're we're kind of here to support we're here to we're here to disseminate some of that stuff but a lot of the good ideas come from our members not from us um so I think there is something for us there in you know how can we be the the brokers of sharing some of those things as they emerge as well uh, the yeah. other thing I would say is in asset management look at your assets mm. in a very different way are you patient are you kind? Do you know how to cook? Do you like children? Those are assets. The moving the, the barriers between work and private life so that you can start to share things that really are you. So we've got some lovely things coming into the chat. So the, the, the picking up of what you just said, Lizzie, the small scale stealthy change um, and people saying that the kind of the things happen in your own backyard, that it's not it's not the kind of big stuff. It's the little stuff. It's the taking um, taking smaller actions, keeping collaborating, starting with your neighbor. And now's being the time to experiment that's the kind of. As we've got the kind of, it came up actually on one of our um, Ways Out of Crisis webinars about the kind of don't waste a good crisis, that you've, we've, we've got the opportunity, things have changed against our will, so now let's change them because of our will. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think all of those things coming up, um, and Elaine, something you said right back at the beginning that I think I will definitely take away from this is that don't, don't think you have to have all the answers, but you can worry away at something and you can think about it and you can try it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be um, an absolute, I know the answer to this. Well, I've long believed that people, if you like people, they forgive you everything. That's what I say. If you don't like them, they forgive you nothing. <laughs> um, um, we don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be try out. It can be help me with this. What ideas do you have? Um, what is going on in the world now is not clear. And um, one has to walk away thinking not clear is the best we're going to get. Um, but is not clear means we have to rely on the moral values, the norms, the traditions we had, what we think is fair, what we think is honorable, all of those internal things which you thought were kind of cheesy are not, turns out to be who you are matters a whole lot here. So 
that is we're coming towards the end of our session um elaine and lizzie was there anything either of you wanted to um finish on before um before we get to the close you know, just uh, I'm loving reflecting on the kind of the things that are coming up in the chat, really. And um, I, I think from a practical perspective, obviously, the Alliance is delivering the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, but we, we do want to be that space where people can kind of throw their ideas and throw their thoughts in and kind of push that stuff back out again. So it's, it's really good to hear this stuff and keep keep feeding it through. And I, I just want to thank Elaine because um, you've been such a brilliant food for thought. I know Louise said she's taken three, three pages of notes and that was halfway through. So um, I can see that people are really enjoying having and a fresh voice, I think. Um, you know, it's been really brilliant to kind of hear your perspective and your sort of beyond the UK perspective, although I know you, you know as well and you've lived here, but just to kind of hear your your views on this and your experience and it's very generous of you to be sharing your resources and offering to speak to people as well so from for my part i'm really very grateful for the time you've given us and really enjoyed speaking to you it's a great pleasure thank you for inviting me yeah. no thank and and thank you both it's it's been marvelous and it's it really is wonderful to have an opportunity especially going into 2021 and we've had a hard year and we might have a um, a hard year to come so to have the chance for everybody to come together and have these sorts of conversations i think is brilliant um for those of you who are starting to leave the webinar when you click leave um you'll get a feedback form that pops up um and it is for us really important to fill it out not just so that we can evaluate the this session itself but also so that we can help shape the program um the evaluation and the consultation has, was helped us get to this sort of event and it helped us identify things like well-being and accessibility so the more you tell us about what you want and need from the rebuilding heritage program the more that we can tailor it to the needs of the heritage sector going forward for the rest of this year um, please do also visit our website www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk to find out more about those events coming up we have two on well-being and two on accessibility and as i mentioned right back at the beginning we are opening for applications for the next round of support on Thursday. You can apply for consultancy and training and the deadline for that is 11 p.m. on Tuesday the 2nd of February 2021. So that's this year and that will be for support being delivered in March and April. So do make sure that you're checking it all out and finding out about the programme, staying in touch, signing up to our mailing list and staying connected. If you need us, we are here. Um, and the same goes for the Heritage Alliance, um, the, the Heritage Alliance has lots of resources available on the website, there's lots of information, the Heritage Alliance has um, the Heritage Update that goes out fortnightly where you can find out all about things that are going on that are relevant to the sector, it's free to sign up um, and everything on the Rebuilding Heritage Programme is free of charge because it's funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, so everything that you come to us for um, will be completely free of charge. So please do apply and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the there's lots of different types of support. There's business planning, consultancy, fundraising, media and communications, well-being and leadership. And you can apply for one thing, you can apply for some things, you can apply for the whole lot. Um, and it isn't a very long application. It's about 30 minutes. Um, and we, we're quite quick with our turnaround. Normally people hear from us within the week um, of the deadline closing. So the deadline closing on the 2nd of February, you'll hear the following week whether or not you're successful. Um, and then the support is rolled out in the following month so that'll be march and april that you'll be able to actually get that support from us so please do visit our website please do um, apply to the program um, we had um, more applicants in the second round than we did in the first we're now going into our third round um, there are rounds after that but um, please do get your applications in for this coming round if you need the support now and um, that's it for me really just to say thank you all so much for attending and I hope that nobody is uh, continuing with lots of long hours into the rest of the evening I hope this was your end of day uh, reward to yourself to have some thinking time and some time to reflect on everything that's happened and what's coming next so have a lovely evening and thank you so much for attending thank you everyone